2007, you did another iconic work, mm -hmm. Absence of an Assignable Cause. You made the heart of a blue sperm whale. Yeah. What made you do that? You know, after the elephant one, you could have, I, I, was, I wanted to look at another sort of image which was iconic, large, also that I could show uh, at about the same time that had that sort of presence. And I'm, I'm an animal enthusiast. I spend a lot of time reading about strange, um, you know, the geographical habits of, of animals, how they live, where they are. And of course, there was this wonderful thing you learn as a child is like the heart of the blue sperm whale is the largest functioning mammal's heart in the world. And it has an iota that a small child could climb through. It's the size of a small Volkswagen car. You know, I've been That's hearing, incredible. it's incredible, isn't it? And yeah. you hear these, uh, you, you, you see, this imagery has stayed with me since I was a kid. And suddenly you just think, well, that's what I need to make. And I spent then about six months researching and trying to get images of the heart of a blue sperm whale. And it proved to be extremely difficult. So eventually I found it in New Zealand um, from a center, a small whale center, where a friend of mine put me in contact with somebody. And they sent me a picture of the whale heart as a, as a line drawing. And it was strange because it was very similar. There was three drawings. One was the human heart the whale heart and the heart of the horse, which are strangely quite similar in function and they have double iotas. Um, so all three of these sort of work in the same way. So for me- So this heart you made was a life-size heart. Yeah, and I kind of used- 14 feet high, I believe. Yeah, and I used some artistic license as well, you know. So in some way, <clears throat> it's the idea of the work, mm -hmm. the idea of the biggest heart in the world floating like a big carbuncle in the ocean. Um, an absence of assignable cause. We don't know why we love. We don't know why we have this thing called pain. We don't know why we, we create, um, we don't know why we make relationships with other people and feel extreme joy or heartbreak. We don't know what that is and we don't know why so we So this work of yours could be about the mystery behind a whale's death. It could be about the mysteries of the heart. It's or about love. It's, it's about, about love, love. Yeah. and just about making a big, fantastical world. Yeah, exactly. But looking at the bindis again, because yeah. it's become a sort of signature style of yours, yeah. what do bindis do for you? You know, they, for me now, it's a material. And what I've been able to do, I've created this language. I've made my own language. I've made a new language. And now I speak that language. So what I do is I, I use it as surface. I use it as, um, as a kind of... They are also, they're, very, they're deeply feminine. Um, the interpretations of how you read the works are deeply feminine. Because a lot of your works are feminine. I think so. Um, or feminist. Yeah I, yeah. I would, yeah, I would agree with that. You know what's interesting is that bindis are so common in India, yeah. but you're probably the first artist to use it as a signature style. I think, uh, you know, what happens is that you take a material and then you just, you just go on a walk with it. What's also interesting is that you use hundreds of thousands of bindis, yeah. but you don't wear one yourself. No, no. <laughs> well, yeah, it would be a bit comical, I think, if I started wearing them. <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> You're not used to the idea. <laughs> um, I think it would just sort of be a reinforcement of something that I don't need to reinforce, actually. <laughs>